Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Harris, and I am pleased to welcome you on behalf of the National High School Center and the Alliance for Excellent Education to this webinar on college and career readiness and linked learning. Before we begin, I'd like to share several housekeeping items. All phones except presenters will remain muted throughout the presentation because of the large number of participants. Those wishing to submit a question can do so by typing into the Q&A box in the lower right corner of the screen, and you can also report any technical difficulties by using the comment box directly above the Q&A box. This is the second in a series of, of Tuesday webinars in June that focus on a variety of issues and practices related to college and career readiness. You may still register for those remaining web webinars at the provided link or access archived recordings at any time on our website. Let's look at today's agenda. After a brief opening remarks by me and my colleague Jessica Kardashian from the Alliance, we will hear a presentation on link learning by Brad Stan, Vice President of ConnectEd. Brad will be followed by Jonathan Raymond and Matt Perry of the Sacramento Unified School District and Cindy Brown and Val Staley from Portugal USD who will share their experiences, challenges, and lessons learned from in implementing linked learning in their respective districts. We will conclude with a Q&A session using a cross-section of questions submitted during the registration process and during today's broadcast. Our presentation today takes place against the backdrop of significant challenges. As David Conley from the Epic Center noted in last week's webinar, we are experiencing a serious aspiration and achievement gap in college and career readiness, whereby 93 out of every 100 middle grade students plan on, go plan on going to college, yet only 26 actually complete the journey. Sadly, many of these going on to college are unprepared for the rigor. According to a 2011 study, only 25% of ACT-tested students were prepared for college-level coursework in the four academic subject areas of English, math, reading, and science. Furthermore, nearly a third of students in post-secondary education take at least one remedial course, and in the college completion rate in the U.S., which frequently takes more than the expected four years, is just 57%. Students face similar challenges in career readiness. In a recent study, more than 400 employees, employers nationwide found deficiencies greatest at the high school level. 81% reported students fell short in their written communication skills, 70% cited a lack of professionalism, and 70% also cited deficiencies in cr critical thinking. Furthermore, a study from the Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce found that by 2018, 63% of jobs will require some sort of post-secondary learning. That means 22 million new workers with post-secondary degrees. Colleges and career readiness challenges exist at the structural level as well. First, there are many variations on how to define college and career readiness and few ways to measure it, especially beyond the common core state standards. Second, the traditional organization and cultures of many high schools create barriers for ensuring that all students graduate college and career ready. Third, many of the college and career readiness services, resources, and initiatives already underway are targeted at specific needs or programs with limited or no alignment with a more comprehensive approach. The good news is there are some promising strategies that have emerged and that are evolving to address these academic and structural challenges. Today, we are, looking at, we are taking a closer look at one of these strategies called link learning, which is a promising approach known generically as multiple pathways. The multiple pathways approach, which builds on the work of Oakes and Saunders, incorporates the key elements of a rigorous and engaging academic and technical core curriculum augmented with field-based experiences and additional supports to help maximize the attainment of all students. Brad Stam and his colleagues will be sharing how link learning is taking this approach to the next level of implementation and some of the challenges and successes they've experienced along the way. But before we delve in more deeply into link learning, I'd like to introduce Ch Jessica Kardashian, who brings greetings from our co-sponsor, the Alliance for Excellent Education, and an update on the federal landscape related to college and career readiness programs. Jessica? 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, even though most of the work uh, is happening at the local and state level, I just want to provide a brief overview of the federal landscape and the ways that uh, at the federal level we can that's being done at the state at local level around college and career readiness and link learning pathways. Uh, the following, uh, the three bills that are mentioned on the side um, are all three up for reauthorization. Some are more overdue than others, but it's a real opportunity to leverage federal support uh, within each of these uh, federal pieces of legislation. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, although it's not moving forward at this time, both the House and the Senate have passed uh, separate bills through the committee, and uh, there's definitely work to do to support uh, multiple pathways within uh, high school reform and different ways that we're thinking about high schools. The Workforce Investment Act, also overdue for reauthorization. There's a Senate bill that hasn't gone through markup, um, but a House bill that has gone through markup. And again, ways that we can better align what's happening in the workforce and what's happening in our schools as well. And then uh, most recently, the Carl D. Perkins Act, which although it was reauthorized in 2006 and is overdue for reauthorization, um, Less of, of uh, less overdue than the than the Workforce Investment Act. There's definitely been a kind of renewed interest at the federal level in the Perkins Act, in particular because of that emphasis of making sure that students graduate both college and career ready, and making sure that they have that practical experience at the school level. So I just want to talk very briefly about Perkins. Uh, next slide, please. The Obama administration blueprint for reform with Perkins and focused on four main areas, the alignment, so making sure that, uh, mul that multiple pathways, career and technical education programs really address the needs of the labor market, sometimes referred to as, as 21st century skills. They also really emphasize collaboration that in order to really support linked learning, it needs to be a joint partnership between secondary schools, institutes of higher education, employers, and other industry partners and community-based organizations so that it's a shared vision. The third piece is accountability, mostly uh, to cover a few, few different goals. One, making sure that there's common definitions, common language around what career and technical education looks like, what work-based learning and, and link learning looks like, and also performance measures to make sure that when we talk about multiple pathways and link learning that there isn't a system where students are tracked into certain courses, but that the quality of program programs are high uh, across programs, and that also that all students in, in schools have opportunities to participate in this type of learning, and that it's not targeted towards certain populations. And then finally, innovation, looking at uh, systemic reform of both state and local level policies to help spur innovation and different ways of, of thinking what the high school experience looks like for students. The Obama administration's blueprint has definitely heightened uh, more, you know, has created a more heightened interest at the federal level in Perkins reauthorization. And so there's a real opportunity to try and um, include policies that support the work that's done at the local level. Some uh, areas of interest that, that might come up during this conversation are, are funding structures and uh, there's definitely a shift at the federal level to move to competitive grant funding which um, one of the concerns with that is, is that with programs like linked learning, you really want to think of them as district-wide uh, programs, statewide programs, that, um, so that every school has the opportunity to participate in them. It's also focused more conversations around who the required partners should be um, and what types of partnerships can help support these types of programs and make sure that they're sustained. Um, and then some other issues when we talk about linked learning, we think about making sure that it's high quality uh, open access for students and that also um, how we look at linked learning might look different in urban school settings versus suburban versus rural and are our federal policies supporting the different contexts within which linked learning and college and career readiness preparation can take place. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, some other things at the federal level, uh, Senators Casey and Representative Thompson uh, introduced companion legislation called the Education for Tomorrow's Jobs Act, which would support linked learning in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And with the renewed interest in Perkins, um, we're definitely hearing from offices on the Hill that are interested 
in introducing or supporting legislation that supports linked learning and work-based learning and making sure that what we do in Perkins is also aligned with ESEA and WEA. We also have at the federal level bipartisan, CT, uh, bipartisan CTE caucus, which is supporting this work, and the Department of Education is not only focused on CTE and, and linked learning and work-based learning, but they've also uh, been speaking very vocally on a couple of other areas that will support the work of linked learning and college and career readiness, specifically a renewed emphasis on project-based learning, um, rethinking the school day and the structure of the school day, school week and school year through expanded learning time, which especially at the high school level can provide students with opportunities to participate in work-based learning and possibly get credit for it. And then the last piece is the data system alignment, which is really key to make sure that we're measuring the success of programs and, and the outcomes for students. So I think there's, although this at the federal level we're definitely more removed from the on-ground work, there are policies that, that uh, we can promote at the federal level to help support uh, college and career readiness and link learning at the state and local level. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. So let's go ahead and take a closer look now at what's taking place on the ground level. So Brad, why don't you uh, get started and, during, and uh, introduce uh, your various colleagues as uh, um, if they're ready to present uh, their perspectives on implementing link learning at the district and school level. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, and also thanks to Jessica for providing us with uh, the federal policy context for this work. It, it seems that there is a reason to be cautiously optimistic uh, that the direct nation is moving in is supportive of truly uh, trying to align our system to increase the numbers of students who are college and career ready, and link learning is one, one key avenue or approach uh, that I think is very promising uh, for meeting that goal. Um, my name is Brad Stam, Vice President at ConnectEd, the California Center for College and Career, and it's my pleasure to be presenting on this webinar today. And um, in a little while, you're going to be hearing from uh, four uh, district practitioners, uh, two from Sacramento City Unified School District, Matt Perry, who's the Director of Secondary School Reform, and Jonathan Raymond, the Superintendent, and they'll be speaking about their experience trying to make college and career readiness a, a measurable uh, reality uh, in their district. Uh, and we'll also be hearing from Cindy Brown, who is the Director of Pathways, and Val Staley, Assistant Superintendent for Education Services from the Porterville Unified School District. Uh, Porterville is a, a rural district. Sacramento is an urban district, both in the state of California, which is the home of the Link Learning District uh, initiative. So I'm going to see if I can drive here. Um, there we go. Uh, so I also want to thank uh, the National High School Center for their leadership in highlighting the efforts by various organizations to more clearly define college and career readiness and to look at strategies around the nation for how to build secondary systems that more accurately assess and support student development of the skills, knowledge, and dispositions that comprise college and career readiness. I was pleased to present in Washington, D.C. last month at their symposium, uh, and I'm happy to have a chance to follow up with this webinar. I'm going to start with a brief focus on the what of college and career readiness. Uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, and then introduce folks to link learning uh, as a how, a promising approach uh, to improving secondary student engagement, motivation, persistence, and achievement. Uh, this approach uh, operates at multiple levels within the system, from the individuals to the way up to the state level. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sacramento and to Porterville uh, to share their experiences on the ground, uh, the uh, moving from talk to action, from rhetoric to reality, and share some of the opportunities and successes uh, and also some of the challenges that they face uh, in trying to actually change an entire system, uh, not just individual schools. Uh, to move in this direction. So it seems that everyone is trying to answer this question, what is college and career readiness? Uh, we're lucky to have preeminent uh, researchers like David Connolly who've devoted their career to providing guidance in this area. ConnectEd recently partnered with Svetlana Darsh from WestEd, which is one of the regional education labs, uh, and we conducted a research synthesis of 20 years worth of work on college readiness and career readiness, from the old scans reports 
uh, including David Connolly's work, uh, work of the P21 Consortium and others, uh, to create a framework that we call College and Career Readiness, What Do We Mean? Uh, and as part of that, we created a side-by-side -side analysis of all of these studies, uh, which is contained in our framework document. And we analyzed the differences and commonalities among the various studies, uh, and by doing so, distilled what we believe are the essential dimensions of college and career readiness. In other words, what came up again and again in study after study as being essential. Our framework includes a narrative history of that 20 years of work, um, a one-page overview with a graphic, a bibliography, a matrix that compares all the different studies side by side, as I said, and then also an annotated list of all of the elements uh, that we have identified as being essential with their definitions and suggestions for uh, measurement and further study, so how you may go about measuring them. Uh, and our goal is to turn it into an online resource by the end of 2012 on ConnectEd's website. Uh, and so we, we believe that this tool, uh, in combination with other tools that are available that the National High School Center and others have, have put out there, uh, we hope will help the work of practitioners as you think about aligning uh, secondary and, uh, systems uh, around assessing and supporting student toward college and career readiness. So here's our little um, unisex, diversely colorful figure of a graduate, of a high school graduate, uh, who contains what we believe are the four key dimensions of college and career readiness. Knowledge, skills, dispositions, uh, and engagement. I'll explain a little bit uh, what each of those means uh, in a minute. But I want you to notice on the figure that there, there are no clear separations or delineations uh, within this individual, within this graduate, uh, because these four uh, dimensions of college and career readiness are interrelated and must work interdependently, not in isolation. Just as we want to keep all of our limbs uh, in order to make uh, navigating life uh, easier, um, we need all four components uh, in order to achieve college and career readiness. Uh, it is possible to survive with fewer limbs, as we know, um, but it, is, it creates a much more challenging uh, reality. So it is important to address um, all four of these elements. You'll notice that our graduate is standing on the three domains of learning that must work together to form a whole. Uh, this is important for our educational institutions to consider. In other words, it's not enough to just engage in academic learning or not enough to engage in just career technical education um, or 21st century skill development. They all have to together comprise um, a complete learning experience for students. Uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, we're on our second draft of this, and we do welcome feedback for how we can improve our framework to make it as useful as possible uh, for practitioners in the field. And you can find a copy of this framework on ConnectEd's website, uh, www.connectedcalifornia.org. We'll show that at the end of the presentation. And it's also on the National High School Center's website um, on their resources page. So we know that college and career readiness is more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's more than basic skills. In fact, we're seeing now, I think, an evolution and a response against uh, what has become, unfortunately, the lowest common denominator test prep orientation uh, to uh, education that I think our recent high-stakes multiple choice-based testing policy has produced, not necessarily intentionally, but uh, I don't think any of us are really surprised uh, that that is what has emerged. Um, while some students, as a result of drill and kill, so to speak, may have amassed a significant amount of factual information, they don't typically possess mastery of the strategies needed to apply that information effectively and to work within what you could call loosely coupled environments like college campuses and workplaces that frequently rely upon both individual initiative and collaborative skill. So what do we have to do to address that uh, in the secondary education system? Well, knowledge, and knowledge has to be academic, technical, and what we call 21st century knowledge. Uh, the 21st century knowledge um, 
is things like uh, global literacy, uh, environmental and financial literacy, and media literacies, many of these cross-disciplinary uh, literacies, along with um, career education, career technical education, uh, knowledge about a broad industry sector and associated technical content in college majors. We also believe that skills must comprise the academic, technical, and 21st century domains as well. So academic skills are typically disciplinary skills. How do you think like a scientist, uh, for example, or how do you write um, like a novelist? Um, technical skills uh, in at least one career area of interest that could be learned in a, a technical course sequence. And then 21st century skills, um, which include uh, the, the four C's that are frequently referred to, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration, but also learn that all-important metacognition. And we also believe systems thinking is important, as well as information management, the ability to manipulate digital media and digital media applications. The third dimension uh, is something uh, that is a little jargony sounding, um, but is, has been found by research to be incredibly essential. Both Tony Carnevale and David Colley, preeminent researchers in this field, talk about um, the, uh, these elements as being actually more highly correlated with long-term success um, than uh, some of these uh, academic uh, knowledge and skills that students learn uh, in the formal school setting. These include um, self-knowledge, self-esteem, self-efficacy, um, dimensions of self-management like goal setting, time management, study skills, persistence, uh, initiative, and then uh, effective organizational and social behavior including leadership, flexibility and adaptability, responsibility, and ethics. And then a fourth category, uh, which some of you may have heard David Connolly talk about college knowledge. Um, we have expanded that to include not only understanding and being able to navigate the world of higher education, but also navigating the world of work and the world of civic life. We know that many students in particular who may not come from families that have experience uh, in higher education may not have a lot of that essential information that is needed to be able to access, navigate, and be successful uh, in the post-secondary arena. And that extends to skills uh, that are essential to the workplace setting as well as to being successful in civic life. If college and career readiness is the what or the goal of secondary education, the emerging focus of next generation accountability systems, including the Common Core State Standards Assessments, uh, are purporting to assess college and career readiness. Um, states that are applying for ESEA waivers have to talk about how their systems are going to assess college and career readiness. Then what about the new how? Is there a new how to go with the new what? How do we get there? I know that folks are on this webinar because they care deeply about improving the experiences, outcomes, and life options for our nation's secondary students. We desperately need to address the dropout crisis and to better engage our young people in becoming college and career ready. What I know for uh, the time that I've been in education now, which is over 23 years or so, is that while we manage to engage students in elementary school and hold on to most of them in middle school, we face a crisis in high school. And so we do have to help students figure out why high school is not working for them. So I'm going to ask you to um, uh, think about the challenge that's confronting us a 75% graduation rate. Students are voting with their feet. Where they can leave, at least a quarter do. And for students who are graduating, only 25% are ready to succeed in college and career. So we have a huge remediation crisis, and I think we know about the cost. The national cost is uh, $5.5 billion in remediation, and the student loan debt is enormous. And many of the students are taking remedial courses in college, uh, community colleges. They're not amassing any credit and fall into the cycle uh, of dropout out of community college as well. So we have a national crisis. California, we have an enormous uh, problem in that we're going to be short over a million college-educated workers uh, unless the current system changes. 
most jobs and the highest job growth areas require some form of post-secondary preparation. Uh, and we are going to be in a world of hurt uh, if we don't change how we're organizing high school. And these are just emblematic of national statistics uh, as well. This is a national crisis. So I'm going to ask uh, folks to use their imagination for a minute. I'm going to ask you to go back in time and think about the year 1912. Uh, that was when the Titanic sailed, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was in office. Um, I'm going to ask you to think about, for a second, um, what did telephones look like in 1912? And how did people, um, what did cars look like? What about the airplane? Um, what about written communication, the typewriter? I'm going to ask you to think about all of those things in 2012. The telephone, the car, the airplane, the computer. And just think about the differences in transportation, communication, and how people are doing jobs today with the information economy. Now I'm going to ask you to think about the high school classroom in 1912. Here's a photo. And here's a photo we recently took of a classroom in 2012, 100 years later. And it kind of forces us to ask the question, what's changed, really? Think of the contrasts in transportation, communication, and how jobs are configured. And think of the fundamental similarities in how education is occurring uh, in the classroom. It's not keeping up. We have, uh, at best, a 20th century education system for a 20th century globalized world. A large amount of the factual information that is being dispensed to those students sitting in those orderly rows uh, can be found on your telephone these days. And uh, there's already a contact lens that is under development that I recently saw an article about that will enable you to have a holographic projection of information at your fingertips, at voice command. Uh, and so um, it presents a fundamental challenge to how we think about the purpose of secondary education. Now, there's been a massive history of school reform, and many well-intentioned attempts have been made to provide uh, improved educations for students. Um, none of these reforms, though, from my perspective, were directed at making fundamental change at every level of the system, including whole school redesign, instructional innovation, raising expectations for all students, and creating coherence within the district system itself involving the community for shared leadership with a goal of sustained transformation. What have we tried? Well, we've tried doubling up on academic course content, more math or more English language arts, uh, frequently done uh, in double block periods, slower, sometimes louder, or so the joke goes. But we know without providing relevance, more of the same isn't going to engage the students who need to be engaged. We also know that just saying, well, let's give them an, an auto shop because they, they're not interested in book learning, um, that's not going to do it either. We absolutely need career and technical education that's high quality and cutting edge, but that alone isn't going to produce student success either. We need a new approach for better results. We need high schools that link strong academics with real world experience. You know how students respond to field trips, job shadowing, internships, opportunities to meet and talk with adults beyond their teachers and their family members, even community service projects. Well, what if instead of those being enhancements or rewards or peripheral activities, they were part of the regular daily experience of students? We need high schools that prepare students for college and career on a daily basis, not just one or the other. Just a word about motivation. So we know that the fundamental challenge in high school is student engagement. Even students who show up every day aren't necessarily engaged in learning. They're not retaining the information. The cliche is that the teacher is droning on in the front of the room while students try to pay attention. Think of peanuts. Think of South Park. Ronald Fryer, a researcher at Harvard, recently um, 
gave 18,000 students a total of $6.3 million to improve their test scores. And this is part getting at the issue of extrinsic motivation. Well, can we reward them into success? Um, when they an analyzed the student response, they saw zero effect. When they surveyed the students, no student mentioned studying harder, doing more homework, asking their teacher to explain things better. This reflects the research on extrinsic carrots and sticks, which is that they have limited impact. In fact, they can have the opposite effect. If we have to bribe kids to do something, we're basically sending the message, explicitly or implicitly, that it shouldn't be enjoyed for its own sake. And the, isn't the goal learning for its own sake or lifelong learners? So we need to build a system that is based on intrinsic motivation, on self-determination and competence. We know that students try harder when they see the relevance of the content and they have choice in how to meet the learning goals. A, a great uh, philosopher, Sink Sent Me High, he studied high school and middle school students self-reporting on levels of engagement. And what he found was in class, students reported high levels of concentration but low levels of interest. In the arts and in sports, students reported high levels of interest and engagement, but they deemed it unimportant because it had little relevance to the adult world or what they perceived as their futures. So how can we get flow into the regular experience of students every day into their academic uh, learning experiences? So we believe that link learning is an approach that does this successfully, and it has four key principles. We're really exploding the old paradigm of the high school as a sorting machine, tracking students from ninth grade to college for a few, voc ed for others, and who knows what for the rest. Rather, link learning pathways are designed to provide all students with a high quality academic and technical education that prepares them for both post-secondary education and careers. In other words, they lead to a full range of post-secondary and career opportunities without privileging any one destination. Link learning classrooms link the classroom to the larger world, and students apply their learning to solve real-world problems. And we have data showing that students in link learning pathways um, are attending at higher rates, they're graduating at higher rates, and they're doing better on a range of achievement indicators and th that cuts across all subgroups. So we believe that link learning is an equity strategy as well as an excellence strategy. The pathway components include a college prep academic core, emphasizing real world applications, a technical core of four or more courses that meet industry standards and provide certification at the end, a sequence of work-based learning activities that span the nine through 12 uh, years, and a system of student support organized within the pathway itself. And this is organized around a four-year program of study. Pathways typically operate as smaller learning communities. We believe a size of anywhere from 250 to 500 is optimal. Um, they can also be career academies or standalone small schools. Teachers are working to integrate academic and career technical course content. So frequently the academic teachers will adopt the theme of the pathway, um, such as health, biomedical science, engineering, law and justice, and also develop integrated projects. Pathways also include opportunities for students to take community college courses, for example, and um, achieve uh, dual credit on courses. Uh, there are some examples where students are graduating with both a high school diploma and an associate's degree or an industry certificate. And project-based student-centered instruction, authentic assessment, and a relevant curriculum are at the center of the pathway experience. So for example, students could be um, figuring out uh, how to address a pandemic. The English students might be reading the hot zone. Uh, while in biology class, they're understanding the virology and epidemiology um, of a pandemic. And in their medical science class, they're understanding the public health protocols that are used to uh, contain that pandemic. And they have to develop a strategy to educate the public and con contain the virus effectively and then present that to uh, public health doctors and nurses. 
uh, as part of their project. I think you can see the high level of authenticity and relevance um, for the students that that would provide. So how do, we, how do we line all this up? Well, yes, we do have a sequence of courses within Link Learning Pathways, but it's really driven by pathway outcomes. And the pathway outcomes are aligned with what the district identifies um, as its goals for graduates. And uh, both the uh, Sacramento folks and the Porterville folks uh, will tell you about how they're making that happen. Um, but you can see in this graphic how a global outcome, such as effective communicator, can get organized in a biomedical health sciences pathway to read a student will employ appropriate terminology and protocols to perform effectively in healthcare settings, and then how courses and projects get aligned to that pathway outcome of effective communication in a healthcare setting. So you see the project that I just described, students will accurately explain the virological properties in their presentation on a vaccine solution to the pandemic project. So we provide a lot of support for uh, teacher teams to start with the pathway outcomes, what they want students to know and be able to do upon graduation, and then to essentially back map down through the grade levels um, what are the benchmarks, the performance benchmarks for students organized around each of those outcomes. So what would communication proficiency look like at the end of ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade? Those then get codified into rubrics that describe those levels of performance, and the rubrics are used to design the projects and the performance tasks uh, through which students will demonstrate their progress and their attainment. And then the analysis of student work informs a revision uh, to those outcomes, and the continuous improvement cycle uh, continues. Pathway out choices range across a variety of industry sectors. Um, and we work with districts to ensure that they provide variety for students so students have choice to the types of industry sectors that are um, responsive to the job growth uh, priorities of their community. Uh, and so we encourage the district to work directly with civic and business and post-secondary leaders uh, to make choices about the pathway options that are available to students. This coalition building also connects uh, business and community partners with students to increase opportunities for mentoring, for internships, uh, for apprenticeships uh, for students so that they have uh, opportunities, real world uh, opportunities uh, to develop their skills and to get the kind of feedback that reflects the professional expectations um, in the larger world. Also with link learning, we don't just work with individual schools and pathways. We work at the district system level with the superintendent and the board and senior district leadership to help them figure out how do they organize and align their district to best support the growth of high quality pathways. Uh, and I think both Sacramento and Porterville will talk a little bit about that. So they can build a system of high quality pathways that offer students a true choice of options. In California, we have a Link Learning District initiative that is funded by the James Irvine Foundation that uh, supports nine districts to move to systemic implementation. You can see the list of districts here. These districts have embraced the goal of anywhere from 50 to 90% of their high schools learning in high quality link learning pathways by 2015, 2016. So this is a multi-year uh, project that is really aimed at transforming the secondary education of students in their districts. And it requires aligning a variety of systemic supports um, across uh, at the school level, the classroom level, um, the district level, and then at the region, and ideally at the state policy level as well, uh, to support that transformed education experience for students. So what are our results? Well, the results are pretty good, and as it, additional data is coming in, uh, we have a new batch of data that is just about uh, ready. Um, we're seeing that across a range of indicators, students who are learning in link learning pathways are outperforming their peers uh, when controlled for demographic variables, uh, their peers who are not in link learning pathways. They graduate at higher rates, they do better on traditional tests, they are more likely to, to meet um, our state university eligibility requirements. Their attendance rates are higher. 
They're less likely to drop out, and they earn more uh, after graduation, especially males. So what are some lessons that we've learned as we're supporting these nine districts to really focus on systems change? Um, you've got to give students a range of choices and access. The pathways must avoid tracking. Um, we have to really guard against uh, the engineering pathways, for example, trying to cream all the A-plus math students. Uh, they have to be open to all students. We have to have a robust professional development uh, support for teachers and administrators. Uh, and that includes providing support for project-based uh, and standards-based curriculum development. Uh, we have to help districts and pathways learn how to partner effectively with uh, industry partners in meaningful ways where they're engaged in designing and assessing, uh, not just in um, giving uh, interviews or internships. Uh, and we also have to develop better assessments of college and career readiness so we can truly measure student progress and build our accountability on outcomes uh, and on high quality delivery because we have learned about how to organize the conditions for success within Pathways. So for some more specific information uh, from our uh, practitioner partners, I'd like to now turn it over uh, to Matt Perry, uh, the Director of uh, Secondary Pathways, and Jonathan Raymond, uh, the Superintendent uh, in Sacramento City Unified School District. Gentlemen. Well, thank you for hosting us, and um, we're we're trying to move on to the next slide here. Joe, I might need a little bit of help there. Just click on the slide and then use the left and right arrows. Left and right arrows. On your Q pad. Yeah, it's not moving forward. All right, I'll take it back, and then you're just going to have to signal me. Yeah. Next. We only have two slides, so just go ahead and take it back. That would be wonderful. So the one, the, the area that we're going to present on is um, regarding our development of a, of a graduate profile, which is, which is really about going, going beyond the concept that young people finish a, a sequence of courses, and then we award them a transcript and a diploma and, and now that's the statement that you've, you've graduated from high school. So we're, we've, uh, we've engaged in developing a graduate profile with our community. And, and I guess um, the first reason we'd want to comment on is why. And so Jonathan Raymond is with us, our superintendent, and it has some very timely statements uh, regarding that topic about why we would want to develop a graduate profile in addition to our graduation requirements. Yeah, so good uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being part of this. Um, you know, Matt and I are actually sitting um, in, a, in a small office adjacent to the president's office at California State University in Sacramento, where we've been meeting this morning um, with, um, with a, a team from, from Sacramento State um, in their engineering and uh, energy department, uh, as well as with the CEO and staff from our, our largest uh, municipality, uh, the Sacramento um, uh, utility. And we're talking about just that issue is how do we create a pathway or, or an academy where we're preparing our young people to be able to manage and navigate and, and I think innovate in, in what is today an emerging technology uh, around the smart grid and, and being able to integrate energy. And, and as we think about what do we need our, our graduates to be able to do and know and to prepare them for success uh, in college and beyond, um, our employer said, you know, we need our graduates not only to have the core academic uh, uh, components and not only to be able to have the, the technical um, components, but, you know, to be successful in the world of, of work and in our world today, they have to be able to, to work as a team. They, they, ha they have to be able, able to, uh, to plan a, a project and to be able to sequence it and to be able to implement they need to be able to write well and, and, and to speak and present orally. Uh, they need to be able to be, to be thoughtful and, and uh, introspective and to be creative. And these are, these are key qualities uh, that we need our graduates to understand. We need them to, to know policy and to know policy framework in which the regulatory business is set. So there's the importance 
um, we just heard just literally within the last hour um, from a major, major employer in, in our region talking about an industry and a technology of the future. So when we put our graduation or graduate profile together, we engaged a, a wide range of stakeholders, including our parents, our students, our uh, industry partners, employers, and our post-secondary partners. And I, I would like to share, um, you know, one one group of parents that I was just absolutely amazed by, by their comment, which was a uh, I, I did some outreach with our parents of our English students learning English. And, and about 35% of our students in our school district are, are, are learning English. And so with this particular group of parents, I, I asked them about skill sets and attributes that they wanted their, their young people to have when they graduated from our high schools. And they were very clear that they wanted them to be able to work effectively on multinational teams on the internet and on telephones on a daily basis. And it, it just it just blew my mind at what a what an accurate bullseye uh, statement that was, and and how they said you know Matt we we already work in this we already work in this venue where our our uh, our families and our histories are from all over the world and we're we're very very comfortable with this and it seems like your schools are not spending much time uh, training young people to to work in this venue in the future, so. You know, in, in very similar fashion, there, you know, we, we took the input from our employers and our post-secondary partners about, about readiness, about executive functioning, and we put it together into a profile and then vetted it out with, uh, with partners and, and back with, uh, with parents again and went through this iterative process over the course of months to, to come up with a graduate profile. And I, and I think the real interesting work now in what we were just engaged in this morning and also with, with what... Uh, Brad, Sam, and Connect Ed have had us work on is how do we assess this? And so what, what we're working on now is developing projects that actually test these different attributes of students over time in a, in a developmentally appropriate sequence. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's a very, very exciting time about stretching what used to be graduation requirements to now a profile that, that, that leverages link learning and, and industry expectations and post-secondary expectations with the emergence of the new Common Core standards and the next generation science standards. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're excited about the work. Um, we're reformatting our projects. And, and, and I think, you know, Jonathan may want to say more, more about this, but something that was remarkable that just happened is that we have our, you know, our, our metropolitan utility district which is developing smart grids where the community is going to be engaged in managing electricity through social networks and also our engineering department with our post-secondary program. And, and quite frankly, I think the business school will be involved in this as well, is that we, there, you know, our, our local industry and local post-secondary partners are looking for these, these holistic graduates from high school to come in and stay local and to, to contribute to the, the well-being and the economy. Um, I don't know if you want to want to add to that at all. I, there's a realization that um, we need to be preparing our young people for multiple multiple entry points, and that uh, we're in an environment as you know you know to hear an employer say you know wow well, this really is K16, and we need to think of it in a very integrated uh, integrated way. But that you know we may have a a, a student coming out of um, one of our our health professions academy or health professions high school that is right now in, uh, in the mechanical engineering uh, program here at Sacramento State. So there, there's no wrong door. We just have to do a better job of connecting the dots and providing, providing clear articulated pathways and opportunities. It's the one thing that I can say that is really you know, distinctly different from school and, and what, what the reality that we have to get to is, is that our our students and their families need these need these roadmaps. They need to be able to navigate, um, so they can see okay what what's the sequence? What are the next steps? And what's special about this program? What will differentiate me from all of the rest? 
And that, I think, is really important, along with this idea of, of how do we make learning real. I think we have to continue to come back to that. And that, I think, is the true power of, of this model. And that's what we heard loud and clear today from our, our industry and our higher education partners is, is the need to make it real, why they need students that are prepared with a certain robust, well-rounded skill set, as well as, you know, let's not, let's not soft sell it, the, the, the core and the technical uh, skills as well, but they need more, and they're recognizing that, that they have to be part of, of, of the solution. Because we heard loud and, and, and clear today, there are several major employers in our region and throughout the state of California that can't find engineers. They can't find the individuals with the skill sets that they required. And we're also finding out from some of our engineering uh, partners here at the, at, at, at the college campus that they're losing young people because they haven't been able to show them how the learning connects to job opportunities necessarily or why is it important and, and how is it real for them. So uh, a lot of the work that we're doing with Link Learning is providing the space and time for teams of teachers to actually develop high quality uh, summative performance-based assessments that, that embed, embed the, the components of the graduate profile. And, and so I, I think we're actually doing rather well with that, with, uh, with, with extremely well thought out projects that have a variety of tasks. Um, that, that relate to the technical aspect of a, of a young person's learning and the academic aspects, but also the, what, what Brad alerted, alluded to earlier, what's coming out of the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, p21.org, um, you know, the, the, major, the major C's around collaboration and, and communication. So, but, but I think kind of the next, you know, the next phase for us or the next zone of proximal development for us as a, as a school district and an initiative is how do we map this data on the, on the on these attributes or skill sets that, that students have? And so, um, ConnectEd has been, done some wonderful work with linking us up with kind of forward-thinking partners like the the New Tech Foundation, which we have a New Tech school which uses a piece of software called Pebble, where where they actually map these. But some some new emerging work with a uh, with with a group called Show Evidence, where we're actually able to to try to begin to to plug in or tag when kids do meet these attributes and, and at what level. And so hopefully we're seeing progression over time where kids are getting better at critical thinking, they're getting better at collaboration, they're getting better at problem solving. And I guess I would, I would, I would tie all this up to say that, you know, the, the CEO of our utility district, John DeSasio, he, he had this amazing comment that they're really looking for a new generation of employees that are able to have a community um, to work collaboratively with a, with a community to, to solve energy problems, and they and they they're they're very very fascinated by how young people are able to work with social networking to, to solve problems, and they want to leverage that that kind of unbridled enthusiasm about engaging communities with uh, with some technical ideas and with some facilitation skills that. That, that are really outside of the boundaries of what we envision uh, our, our current workforce doing. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, the, I don't want to, you know, I want to underscore it is, is that the, I think the real power of this is, is that um, we're, we're beginning to and, and we really need to connect higher, higher education uh, to these academies and, and pathways, and we need to connect employers. And I think doing it, doing it first and as we're discussing it now, uh, it, it, it is really essential. And that it, this isn't typical. Oftentimes we'll think about designing a particular pathway and, 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 and then we will go out to start uh, bringing in our higher education partners and our employee partners. And, and I think the message that, that we're saying here and that we learned loud and clear today is, is that it needs to be seamless. And you need to start, you need to start almost with the end in mind and, and bring these partnerships because they're really hard to, hard to build once you've kind of landed on a, on a model. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan Raymond and Matt Perry, for sharing the exciting work in Sacramento. I think we'd all agree. I mean, I know I'm sitting here listening and feeling 
Very excited. Like you are forging into the future and helping bring the future to the students of Sacramento City Unified. Uh, and I'd like to turn it over now to Porterville Unified to hear from Val Staley, Assistant Superintendent for Education Services, and Cindy Brown, the Director of Pathways, to hear Porterville's uh, story and its journey of bringing the future to the present. Go ahead. Thank you, Brad. Um, this is Cindy Brown. I'm Director of Student Pathways for Portable Unified. Joining me today is uh, Val Staley, Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services. And John Snavely, our superintendent, um, is here as well. So he's going to give a little overview of Portable Unified School District. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for your uh, flexibility in allowing me to, to participate. Um, Portable Unified were somewhat unique. If you recall the map that was up a little earlier showing California, you had a cluster down of uh, pathway districts down in the Southern California area and another cluster up in the what would be the northern part of the state. And then you noticed one district down in the middle, Portable Unified, which is uh, 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 we pretty much stand alone by ourselves. Uh, we're in an agricultural area, uh, somewhat isolated. We're in a community of 50,000 uh, of population, but yet our uh, land area stretches out over 3,000 square miles for our high school students. So as you can imagine, we have a, an immense uh, transportation system. Uh, we have a population of about 63% Hispanic, 20% uh, Caucasian, and 6-7% of uh, other um, ethnicities, 24% uh, English language learners, 79% low income. Uh, but one thing we have that's a very positive is we have a very supportive uh, community that recognizes education as a way to address uh, some of these barriers that we have. Although we do not have a four-year university within our county even, um, that's been one of our challenges is to determine how do we create this college going down culture that quite frankly did not exist. Uh, many years ago. So to help uh, describe how we needed and how we went about creating this vision, I'll ask uh, Dr. Val Staley to give you information. Next Good slide. afternoon. We have the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, when we began as a district to develop the Connect Ed and Link Learning model with Pathways, uh, we were really mission rich. We had many varieties of mission statements, uh, from varying versions of school sites, publications, grant proposals, but pretty outcome specific poor. When we as a team uh, first met at the Stanford First Summer Institute and we began talking about how we might build uh, a district wide, very uh, succinct and outcome specific statement and one that would provide guidance so that we would have specific support for the link learning concepts. We, we came to the conclusion pretty rapidly that we needed to increase and make more open and more collaborative our process of gaining input from the community, from our teachers, from our administrators, and look at that in an entirely different uh, manner and make it much more inclusive. And we started with the data about students. Uh, we reviewed uh, the input that we received, and I think Cindy will go over those specific ones, but on the slide you can see that we have a JDAC, in our terms, the Joint District Administrative Council, we have our board, we have some coalitions with the P8, uh, which is our business uh, advisory groups, some pathway leads, and our K-12 teachers. But a way to bring all that together, to bring it down into some guiding statements, I think that was our very first challenge. Uh, we went through many drafts, uh, each one becoming a little sharper in focus upon graduate outcomes. But Cindy, I think if you can provide more details of these expanded community groups and, and how we brought them together. Certainly. 
the purpose of informing each other and collaborating and communi out this, communicating out um, this work um, takes a committee structure, and we have developed that community involvement, and it has become the framework for our pathway system of support. Um, we found that by empowering key stakeholders with the ability to make decisions, it naturally builds their interest and their buy-in and commitment to the shared vision of Portable Unified School District. Our circle of input has broadened from the um, groups that Val had mentioned. Uh, we've added to our committee structure of advisory boards specific to career theme pathways made up of private industry partners. Uh, we've begun meeting regularly with these folks as well as the pathway teacher leads, counselors, and going back to the teachers, they are comprised of not only the career technical teachers, but the core teachers, the math, the science, the social science, and the English teachers. Um, with collaborative input with site principals, the parents, the students, we formed that broad-based coalition that Val mentioned. That's our executive level of business professional board that gives input on policies and procedures around pathway outcome support and the sustainability of this whole approach. The development of the district-wide graduate outcomes has brought a new level of collaborative discussion and sharing among this broad spectrum of stakeholders and perspectives. The mission, uh, next slide please. Thank you. The mission and the vision were clearly indicative of what graduates were expected to know and be able to do. And after three years of review and revision, our governing board approved this guiding the guiding statements for Portable Unified School District. The graduate outcomes have created a filter of direction for our district, serving as a compass to do or not to do things. The outcomes help drive the creation of college and career ready projects that have a purpose. Programs are not just created to fill a gap. So how are we using these graduate outcomes? In the high school level, pathway outcomes, courses, and projects are being aligned with the graduate outcomes. As you recall, Brad had mentioned the vertical alignment of outcomes. Um, this is what we are in the process of doing. It's hard work, but having these graduate expectations um, aligned with the outcomes and broken down to career theme level to, does provide meaning and relevance to the lessons that the students are learning. For example, taking the expected graduate outcomes of developing effective communicators through the lens of the career theme um, takes on the form of student presentations communicating appropriate medical terminology. For an art student, communicating artwork or sculpture work. And a computer tech student would be communicating through a website design that they have designed. They're also embedded in career and college preparation and pre-employment skills training for our students. It is essential to have our professional partners uh, who are the true consumers of our products being a part of the assessment work. They need to be on hand to voice to us what the students need to learn and what they want to see the students um, have learned to be successful future leaders in their workplace. Overall, it clearly makes sense to us to have these adopted outcomes lead the driving force of a systemic implementation and assessment plan for our district. We could have the next slide. Any change process gives you surprises. And we were pleasantly surprised that some of the gifts that we have uh, received from this finalized version of the guiding statements, particularly because of that very broad-based involvement that we had, was that we have created within our district now a culture that we are K-12. The clear message that graduation starts in kindergarten. And as our district administration meetings that included kindergarten through the senior high school level, uh, they began to prioritize graduate outcomes. And the elementary principals are saying, okay, we see how this is going to fit. We are really backward planning from graduate outcomes to entrance into our school system. Uh, and some of that career awareness clearly has taken on an importance now in our K-12. Cindy, if you could provide some specifics on that. Sure. Uh, with the much more finalized uh, version of our guiding statements, unexpected shifts um, have occurred um, in our elementary and middle school levels. For an example, uh, as you can see this flyer, we completely revamped our after-school program, and this is for first grade through eighth grade students. 
revamping the academic enrichment component into a college and career ready program. Uh, each month in the school year is dedicated to a career theme exploring the California's 15 industry sectors through project based learning. This program is, connects our elementary and middle school students to potential careers and college options that they may never have thought of before. And it gives them exposure to more options available to them, but also provides them with more information to make an educated choice when it comes time for them to go into um, high school pathway program. Another example of an outcome shift um, is in the creation of other programs promoting college and career exploration through our community partners. Um, the Rotary, um, all three Rotary clubs here in uh, Porterville have created a day for seniors uh, that was um, originally for seniors going out to work with local business partners in a job shadowing um, opportunity. But now it's been expanded um, through their voice. They stated that we needed to start earlier with our sophomores going on career exploration field trips, um, juniors focusing on career areas by um, job shadowing and internships, and then our eighth graders as well observing high school pathway options. So the Rotary Career Seeing now has taken on the message of connecting learning to earning. Next slide, please. Another unexpected shift is reflected in the work displayed in this slide. Uh, the drive to focus on graduate outcomes has organically touched our elementary staff. This, just this past week, hot off the press, we received this rubric created to assess student performance. Um, K through three, as well on the top um, bar, you'll see um, illustrating the initial stages of a student's skill level and the expected outcome of a student who has achieved the skill of communication. Uh, the bottom bar um, illustrates the fourth through sixth grade students um, with the same rubric of initial skill level progressing, leading to achievement of the skill levels. We see our graduate outcomes becoming a part of the K through 12 culture. There is ownership of our graduate outcomes and a recognition that graduation preparation begins in kindergarten. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy, John, and Val, uh, for sharing the exciting work that is going on in Porterville Unified. And I think, uh, I hope that people on the webinar today can truly see how Linked learning is a systemic initiative. It is not an isolated change effort at individual schools, but it is really an effort to map backwards from what research and community together believe students should know and be able to do upon graduation, and then reorganizing and realigning the entire system of education, perhaps starting in secondary, but ideally extending K-12, uh, P-12, uh, to support all students to successfully progress uh, and attain those college and career ready outcomes. And we believe that it must be done by putting the students at the center and ensuring that their academic learning has the real world relevance and context needed to spark their motivation and interest to persist and to succeed. And if you'd like more information, we invite you to go to ConnectEd's website there are a variety of short videos that explain many aspects of linked learning, and you can hear more stories and student voices there, as well as a whole host of tools from a guide on how to create a broad-based coalition to the criteria for a high-quality linked learning pathway, www.connectedcalifornia.org. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe Harris, uh, who's the host for the Q&A section. Thanks, Brad, and thanks to um, our uh, other presenters as well. Uh, I was looking through this list of questions that we collected during the registration process, and I'm pleased to say that many of them had been answered by our, uh, by our presenters um, as part of their explanation of their individual implementation uh, challenges and, and successes. But I do have a few more, and we have a few more coming in on the line. And again, I want to encourage anybody who'd like to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A box. So let's start with a few of the, um, of the previous questions while we wait for some more to come in over the line. Um, I'm going to direct this first question at Matt Perry. 
Um, how does a student enroll? Is there an application process or open enrollment? And then once a student is enrolled, how do they navigate the education and career choices? Do they have a mentor, a guidance counselor, or what? So uh, all of our link learning pathways are open enrollment. They're open to all students. They're open to students with special needs. They're open to students that are learning English. And we use a we use a unbiased and a district wide enrollment center. So their job is to enroll young people into school. Um, and and so we we make sure that you know we're we're allowing everybody the same access into the schools. So so um, you know the the real the real challenge about equity there is making sure that all families and all cultures are getting information in a in an appropriate fashion so they understand what the options are. So beginning in about October, October through February, principals and faculty and students are doing a very intense job with outreach and recruitment to make sure everybody knows what their options are. And we have posters and brochures and we do a lot of direct mailing into home. So in addition to that, once a young person starts in a pathway, they, they go through an induction program as a uh, an incoming ninth grader, the summer before their ninth grade year starts, they, they usually have a, oh, maybe three or four days of three to four hour days on the campus in the summer to, to get inducted onto the school, to meet each other, to meet the faculty. Um, and then the next step is that we, we assign a counselor to each pathway. So if you're a small high school, you have a counselor who's on that campus. If you are a large comprehensive high school, then uh, the counselors link up with specific pathways and, and adopt them and become experts at them. And, and so that, at that point, the expectation is that all the faculty within that pathway are responsible for all the students in that pathway and their well-being and their eventual success. And, and we, so we, we look at it as a four-year relationship with each student, and, uh, and there's one goal, which is uh, to make sure that 100% of the young people are ready for the post-secondary environment of their choice without remediation. We've done really well with getting 100% of them into post-secondary, um, but, but we're still working deeply on the remediation needs. I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you. Um, so this is now a question directed to either Cindy or Val. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the empowerment of stakeholders? Cindy? Okay, yes. Um, I think it's essential to have the stakeholders um, have a voice. We have found that to be extremely valuable for Portable Unified by allowing them to give their expertise um, in advisory board meetings or in regards to uh, assessment of student performance or even what um, courses should be in the course sequence tying that to what students should have when they do graduate and do join that workforce. Giving them that empowerment only assists us with um, communicating the message, marketing what we have to offer, as well as building the knowledge of link learning and, and spreading the gospel of um, how integral and strong this approach is. So I think that was one of our lessons learned was the importance of building that uh, empowerment. That business partners needed, well, it's crucial that they feel that their input has an effect and helps create change. Great. So let me ask a follow-up question. Uh, as a rural district, how do you engage business and industry? I'm looking well, at John. <laughs> I, I, might, I can address that. Uh, it's been a very active and aggressive campaign, quite frankly, to reach out to our business community. I think a key was uh, actively involving our Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they have been very uh, helpful and critical in helping to promote this among our business partners and such. We have uh, you know, quite a variety of industry in here. Uh, even though it's, you know, we're primarily agriculture, we still have a number of manufacturing facilities, uh, uh, warehousing and so on, and, and so engaging those business partners, the CEOs, 
um, all the different players, and as Cindy and Val both indicated, making them feel as though or not feel, but actually having them empowered and part of the process. Uh, it, it just they want to come back. They want to participate. Uh, it's no longer a matter of us having to reach out. Quite frankly, we have businesses knocking on our doors asking, how can we participate? How can we be involved? The community Great. college connection was also strong in bringing in other business partners. Great. Thanks, John and, and uh, Val as well. Um, so uh, there's a money question, so I'm going to ask that to uh, one, our two superintendents. Jonathan and, and uh, Raymond and uh, John Snavely, um, what are the costs associated with implementing link learning and how have budget cuts in California impacted your implementation plans? John, Jonathan had to step out to this um, other meeting, so I'll, I'll let you go first and if, you know, certainly you're more, more adept at answering that as superintendent. Sure. I, I think probably what is the most critical from an overall standpoint is the staff development. Uh, the time involved with that, you know, we try to do everything we can to minimize taking teachers out of the classroom uh, so that we're not disrupting the everyday instruction. So those uh, summertime periods, the weekends, the evenings, uh, the, you know, just all the staff development because it is a new way of, of teaching, a new way of education for our high school students. Having them talk to each other, uh, the collaboration time, scheduling is, is critical. Uh, and so those all have a fairly significant uh, cost factor. Uh, there are some additional staffing issues uh, when you, you have to, in our opinion, you, you have to have a director, someone who's kind of your point person for this whole program that can help facilitate and be the one contact for all segments of the operation in this particular area. So the staffing uh, is, is critical. We have also, a lesson we learned was, was uh, valuing the, um, the pathway leads, and we ultimately offered them a stipend because we recognized that that was very time-consuming, very intensive responsibility we were placing on them. So bottom line, you know, it's, it talks about the additional costs we've had. Now, how have we addressed it? You know, we've just realized that that is our high school reform initiative. That's our focus. That's what's driving our high school operation right now, and that is our our primary uh, focus, that uh, the school board is very actively involved in our process, and so they understand the, and appreciate the value, and it's just a funding commitment. Uh, Joe, this is Brad Salmon. One thing that I just wanted to add to John Snavely's comment is that um, California being almost 50th out of 50 in per pupil funding. Uh, if we can do this in California, given the state of our budget cuts, uh, it states that fund education more generously or dare I say responsibly uh, should have no problem uh, in uh, providing link learning. In fact, we are just about to launch a link learning Michigan uh, uh, initiative. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is that in many systems, uh, funding comes to school districts based upon the average daily attendance of students. So this is very much an investment in improving the academic return on investment, if you will, through improved attendance, uh, improved attainment, um, that districts will uh, realize um, the gains uh, over time, and so will the state and the nation. Okay. Brad, I, I may chime in. I, I think we've noticed a very um, kind of interesting commitment by industry lately, at least in the in the urban center of, of Sacramento, where industry knows how hard the schools have been hit. And, and we actually share our, our budget sheets with them and, and show them, you know, the programs that we've closed. And, and we've, we've closed almost all of our programs, but our technical and link learning programs are still open and still funded, and so we're we're showing that we have a commitment, and, and industry is really stepping up to the plate and saying, you know, we, we can get you through this. We can afford $100,000 a year for the next five years for your health high school to put one of our people um, there to teach classes in the morning and then take your people out, uh, take your kids out to the hospital for their internships, and and I think industry is aware. I mean, they're they're clear in California. The schools are getting hit hard, and uh, 
maybe industry is going to bounce back a little bit earlier or or has better flexibility with their budget so with you know with a strong relationship base they're they're pitching in to help great thanks to both of you um so let's look at a question now i uh, i think it, this was uh, answered partially by man in terms of english language learners so i'm going to ask the same question to cindy does link learning serve all English language learners and what adjustments have been necessary to address English language learner student needs? Link learning actually addresses all the students, um, English language learners, the special ed, any of our subpopulations, even our advanced students. That, um, you know, we see it as every student needs an individualized plan. And we will address, um, if you specifically want to talk about English language learners, we will ensure that in their schedule for classes that they will have um, the courses that they need in order to um, move to the proficient level as quick as possible and still be college ready um, with their college prep courses. We'll provide them intervention, um, tutoring, whatever it takes so that they can be successful. I think it's also important that the families for the English language learners. Uh, we have translation at all of the meetings available for parents so that from the very beginning the parents feel like they are placing their students in an educational situation that is sensitive to the language needs of the family as well as the students. So when we go out and we're recruiting the students actually we bring the, all the middle school students um, to one venue. And as Val mentioned, we have translation for the parents, we have sessions um, uh, to address any of their needs or um, um, possibly just even um, to address any cultural, um, you know, um, fears. fears that they may have um, to ensure that they understand that this is for all students. Um, there's translation and all the marketing materials that we use. And um, we've even paced house, house visits to some of the parents, particularly if they have a son or daughter that uh, is a little more forward thinking and, and wants to join a pathway based on interest. Great. So Val, let me ask another question. Um, what changes were necessary to implement link learning at the district level, at the classroom level? Are there staffing uh, issues? Were there policy barriers, political barriers? How did you overcome those? Uh, yes, to all of those. Uh, of course, one of our largest uh, barriers would have been transportation. You know, as, as John described, the district, and we have 3,000 square miles, uh, we made the commitment, our board made the commitment that there would be an open access for all students, and if their resident school was not the school that offered their pathway of choice, that transportation would be provided. Uh, and I, I think that was a, a goal that we have met with all of the pathways now. Additionally, looking at contract language, this year we were able to add into uh, our contract language some skipping criteria so that we can protect those teachers or those teachers that have the training and the experience and link learning have some protection, even though they may be very uh, new teachers. And then the entire staff development, making sure that we are not overlooking teachers that are not in pathways, but provide them opportunities that overlap with the opportunities that we provide uh, teachers that are in that pathway. Great. So, um, Brad, let me ask you a, a question or two because they're about uh, they're California level questions. First of all. Why is California, or why is Link Learning using a 15 industry sectors instead of the 16 career clusters being used nationally by OVAE and ACTE? Uh, because California has 15 instead of 16, I don't know why California feels special. Uh, but the main, the main difference there is that California collapses business and finance and nationally they're separated out. So we're actually in the process of changing that uh, as we move beyond California. I think it's part of the general California cutback that, it, that there's a natural <laughs> cutback from 16 to 15, probably on its way down to 12 at this rate, right? Um, well, I'm looking at the time. I think we have uh, time uh, um, for one more question. 
And I, this is, I'm not sure who to answer, ask this question to, but we did have a question come in. How can we access your LEA graduate profile? That would, for Porterville, it would be on our website. Great. For Porterville Unified School District. Okay. Porterville PortervilleSchools.org. Great. Um, well, thanks so much. It's about 428, so I want to honor everybody's time and thank all of our, uh, all of our presenters for a, a very thorough and thought-provoking presentation. I think the combination of the uh, general introduction to the, print, the components and principles of linked learning combined with some of the real on-the-ground a uh, lot of successes and some of the challenges that you've uh, overcome along the way, and especially seeing it from an um, urban perspective and a rural perspective has been very helpful. Um, I want to, again, thank everybody, our, uh, not only all of our presenters, but our participants who stayed with us for the presentation, for the thought-provoking questions, and to let everybody know that uh, we will be posting the um, the recording of this event. Uh, we had a slight technical glitch that we have to resolve in the opening part, but we'll do that quickly. But we will have the slides available and all the bank background information available. And we'll be inviting um, you uh, to visit our new uh, co uh, community practice on college and career readiness. And perhaps we can continue and invite some of our presenters to continue threaded discussions about some of the areas. I do want to remind everybody we have two upcoming webinars next Tuesday, the, the following two Tuesdays that you can still register for. And, in, and I want to then also share with you um, the, the different ways that you can get in touch with us at the High School Center. Um, uh, our website at betterhighschools.org. We do have a Twitter account and a Facebook account. And again, you can visit our blog and our uh, YouTube channel. And also from our website, you can access our new community of practice that we rolled out next week. So this is the beginning of a long conversation. We hope that we can stay engaged with you. Um, and again, uh, hope that we can continue to share with you uh, these types of promising pro, uh, practices that are emerging and are spreading in, uh, throughout uh, um, various school districts. Thanks for every, to everyone for your engagement. We look forward to talking to you soon.